can we expect from this new CIF um, capital mechanism that has just been launched? Hello and welcome to our continued series of COP29 updates on Green Growth TV. As the conference progresses, we're taking a closer look at the key issues, discussions and decisions that are shaping global response to climate change. From financial pledges to the operationalization of crucial frameworks, COP29 has so far been a hub of both progress and debate. And I have three guests joining me to unpack these developments. We have Gibson Kiragu, climate change consultant at the Leveraging for Energy Assets Finance Framework, AFDB. And joining us from Baku, we have David Munene, board chair, Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute. And also joining in from Baku is Olumide Idou, Executive Director, International Climate Change Development Initiative. Thank you all so much for joining. How are you all doing today? Good. So good to have you again with us, Gibson. And uh, Olumide and David, how are you all doing? I'm, I'm, I'm very well. I'm dressing the uh, checking in winter with great pride. I'm happy to have seen the sun. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right, so let's just get right into it. Um, I want to start with you, Gibson. Well, uh, we want to start, first of all, looking at the big announcement that happened about two days ago from the UK Prime Minister. He announced the launch of the CIF Capital Market Mechanism on the London Stock Exchange. And this supposedly is supposed to mobilize up to $75, um, dollar, uh, $75 uh, billion in the climate finance. So what's the significance of this and what impact would it have on closing the climate finance gap over the uh, next decade? So what can we expect from this new CIF um, capital mechanism that has just been launched? Thank you, thank you, Tony, for, for this and calling me back to this studio. And um, this is a, a, a shot in the arm. It was a, it was a great uh, uh, motivator maybe to other, other, other leaders. Um, and you, you, you are sure you, you, you had the first decision was uh, the Article 6.4 uh, mechanism, crediting mechanism that was passed the first day. And so uh, different, uh, different countries are supposed to be thinking, what are we going to do for the new uh, collective uh, quantitative goal that yeah. is about to happen? And the idea of having um, different and non-traditional methods of, uh, of raising funds uh, maybe the thing that uh, promoted UK, which actually uh, gave out their new NDC, uh, one of the countries that was able to release the NDC. And in this, they are trying to look at um, mobilizing public, uh, private finances uh, through bonds. And um, of course, this is from a report that the independent high level expert group. Uh, that advises that you have to shift away from the traditional uh, domestic resources that come from public uh, funds, uh, which many countries are uh, the funds are going down, and so they are they are taxpayers uh, refusing to to authorize a lot of. So we are trying to see how we can motivate uh, private finances uh, to come into the into the into the arena. And definitely, uh, this is um, a situation that we are going to see uh, a number of, of, uh, of, of other uh, multilateral banks, of course, uh, coming into the picture. Of course, we have bilaterals also are being signed between countries. Uh, and of course, uh, there has been a push that South-South, we should also be having uh, the, in the, uh, the developing countries also uh, coming in to assist in raising these resources. And of course, uh, of course, there has been a lot of complaints about the loans that have been given for some climate activities. And uh, with now the, the Paris Agreement also uh, passing on this uh, issue of uh, carbon credits, uh, carbon markets, and those will be other sources of resources that, that will come up. So um, I, I believe that uh, this uh, announcement by UK um, uh, it, it's going to having realized that they, they have caused because of Britex they are out of uh, European Union. Uh, they might trigger, they, they, they might come up, and of course they are also predicting maybe US is trying to withdraw a bit. Uh, so so they, they they are also taking leads. 
uh, because in case of uh, there is of course geopolitics that are taking place in the world. So there could also be politics within that, and uh, we need to see how it pans out. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, let me come to you, David, as well. I also want to throw that question to you just to hear your thoughts on uh, what's the significance of this and what impacts do you think it would have on closing the climate finance gap that we're looking to achieve over the next decade? So what, what are your thoughts on this announcement by the UK Prime Minister? Uh, thanks for that question. I, I, I have um, a bit of different uh, perspectives on the same. I think it's another added promise that people will have to again follow up to fight for to see whether it, it, it comes into fruition. I, I figure that this is not the first time you're getting uh, such kind of promises. We even had the past in uh, Glasgow in the uh, COP26. And this is not new in any way, if, uh, if you ask me. And I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate here, I'm just trying to be a realist. I mean, we have had promises on climate finance left, right, and center as we speak now, even though uh, I, I might be speaking a bit into a lot of damage fund. We have had pledges since last year. How many uh, parts are willing even to commit the actual resources into this? That's uh, a big question for me. I think uh, the UK is definitely a trendsetter in terms of um, the climate agenda and also the geopolitical agenda. And given the history, which I would prefer not to go to uh, in this regard. But then it also demonstrates a commitment by the government, a spoken commitment of life. It's a verbal commitment. We would wait for 2035 to see the realization of the thing. Mm. But I do think uh, on the positive side that it inspires others to, again, perhaps uh, give uh, commitments and also make pledges and promises. But the issue of making promises is not new in the case. Uh, otherwise, we would not mm. be discussing deficits in adaptation finance. We would not be discussing issues with the mitigation and so on. And in terms of financing, loss and damage would have been an easy thing, a low hanging fruit for people to actually see because it's something that is lost and damaged. But uh, the issue of um, even having substantive disagreement at the very beginning of the COP on, on the on the days of or the initial days of the negotiations concerning how uh, financing looks like and even the new quantified or the new collective quantified goal on financing is a bit different. Again, there is need to not just speak about the financing itself, but also to speak about the financial architecture, which also limits access in many ways than one. And again, from the Global South perspective, and especially an African perspective, we need to look at how much that actually translates. Is it um, a, a, a carrot that is in jungle that young people might be able to promise and perhaps they will come promising? Or is it just another promise that then we will wait for another perhaps different government? Because definitely the government that is promising now in the UK is not a government that is expected to deliver by 2035. Unless this government that has made the promise actually puts money where it is, uh, it is mouthy, then mm -hmm. we are just talking about another additional pledge that will mean that we as climate activists will still continue to pressurize and say, oh, look guys, you promised and a promise is a debt. But today, those who promise, he is as a debt indeed. I think that's a big question. Um, when these conversations began, I was I was barely a young boy. Now I'm coming mm. to a few pledges that were made when I was a very small boy as a grown man in children. I think uh, I am not usually excited by promises as much mm. as I am excited about the Libra. All right, thank you so much. So now let's let's come to you, Um David has already mentioned, uh, talked about the loss and damage fund. We have you over there at the conference, and we know that at COP29, negotiators are set to sign um, the agreement on the loss and damage fund. So how do you foresee that? How do you foresee the success of this fund? Uh, what do you expect, or what can we expect from this fund? Are there is there real progress going on at the conference to ensure that this initiative is actually pushed forward and then we can see the success of what is expected from this um, initiative. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for me, I, I think the success of this uh, loss and damage fund that is established, uh, you know, in this uh, COP29 is actually uh, a commitment and a, a, a cooperation of development nations, the developed nations. I think if you look at it uh, historically, Lot, uh, lots of damage fund that has been established, uh, several you know, COP, 
and for us to provide an adequate support for climate-related you know, losses, both for developing countries. I think uh, it, it's supposed to represent the significant steps in acknowledging the financial uh, responsibility of richer countries. But, you know, skepticism has actually remained the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of commitment we see, especially the attempt to, you know, redefine what uh, constitution uh, that constitutes in developed nations. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we need to look at how can we start, you know, reclassify this issue of loss and damage, you know, for potential issues in developing countries and to keep accountability and transparency so that all these nations can be able to contribute meaningfully to the fund. And contributing meaningfully to the fund will represent transparency and accountability so that the initiative or the fund can be successful. So it, it actually requires not only financial pledge, but also to also see how we can uh, reduce the, uh, the framework for transparency and accountability so that uh, uh, the funds can see the, you know, the day of light, so that the allocation and utilization of this fund can be a purposeful uh, action that will address the climate-related uh, damages. If you look at uh, Nigeria, for example, the sea level rise, the flooding, the, um, the, uh, the oil, oil and gas spillage and stops, how do we make sure that when two elephants are fighting, they say the grass suffers it. How do we make sure that this fund that is going to be lost and damaged, or this fund that is being pledged, is going to actually be the purpose of addressing climate related uh, damages? So I think that's one of the things that we need to be looking at uh, as we continue, because there's a lot of pledges that has been going on, a lot of mm -hmm. commitment in the issue of loss and damage. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And now, Gibson, let me ask you, because now um, Olumide has pointed out that one of the most important things is the commitment of the developed nations to this loss and damage fund. So, but now the question is, do you, do you think that these developed nations are on our side? And how, how are we sure that we'll commit to this goal? Because like you said, there's still the issue of them still trying to widen the definition of being a developed nation. So how, how are we certain that they would be committed to helping the vulnerable communities that have suffered this this climate crisis and what how um, what can we do uh, to ensure that they're able to support us how do we ensure that in this conference whatever pledges they make are actually able to achieve the desired result that we want to see uh, thank you thank you uh, listen to my colleagues and uh, uh, the, the opinions uh, that we, we are giving here um, are based, uh, of course, we have the historic background of what has been happening in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, we are also looking at uh, the, the, the push for loss and damage was actually uh, reparation. Uh, people that are losing their island, they are losing their land, they are losing their livestock, and it's happened mostly in the global south. Uh, it's only recently that uh, a number of uh, impacts, uh, extreme events are taking place in the global north. We've seen some landslides, we have seen some flooding in some towns uh, in those countries. And uh, by and by, the, uh, everybody now in the world starts to realize that there can come very extreme events uh, that are beyond your resilience, they are beyond your adaptation, and uh, beyond your budgets that you had already planned and uh, uh, budgeted for through your parliament, and you'll need some neighbor to come over and assist you. It's uh, like an emergency. And therefore, I find uh, a lot of, of course, resistance uh, from the global north to bring money to adaptation and uh, loss and damage. In fact, most of the times, uh, there is always this feeling that uh, loss and damage is part of adaptation, is because you don't have resilience um, and all that, and you are you are able to see the um, the, 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 uh, the slow onset uh, events. They should have you should have known they are coming, and you should have prepared for that. But Sunday recently, when the, these extreme events are happening in the global north, that they have realized that whichever plans you have already made, whichever uh, the development and the early warning systems that you already put in place, we shall be talking about that later, uh, you, you, you will definitely uh, need some uh, reserve somewhere, some money somewhere, some country, some board somewhere to immediately come on board. So I think the, 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 the problem now has been that... Uh, Already, 
even when the, the director of the loss and damage is being asked uh, in COP29, uh, what are the, mod the modalities of applying for this money, uh, is still not clear. And this is what we are hoping that in COP29, uh, there are some modalities and procedures for accessing these funds uh, will be found. Of course, there has been the struggle about where to headquarter it and what to do, and that has been settled. Uh, the trustee, of course, is World Bank, and World Bank has other funds for, for climate change. So um, are, they really, uh, are they really willing to, 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 to hold on that the earlier horse so that this new horse can take up and can take over and start learning to, to, to the world? And they also have other, uh, other, uh, other funds that they, they, they put into to, to other emergencies. So... There is this uh, conflict of interest, and um, we hope uh, that the, the fight in the new collective goal, uh, uh, where some uh, the IGN is saying uh, we need to have uh, loss and damage within the, the new goal, uh, what developed countries are saying, no, let's not bring the, 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 the loss and damage fund into this uh, new goal. So... Uh, we, still, we are still on the, on the on, uh, crossing our fingers. We hope by next week a solution will be found and we'll be able to see. Uh, are we going to sign something, a document that will make us uh, hold one another responsible for contributing to these funds and also how transparency, uh, transparent it should be uh, in a way of accessing these funds? So it's still uh, 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 something we are, uh, are here in the, in the forest that we are actually looking at. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, you also, um, earlier, you said something about, like, now we're looking at the, how the funds are being raised. And I know uh, at the beginning, you said how that the major approach to raising these funds is through investments from private entities, because we're trying to ease the burden of governments for these financial initiatives. So do you, do you think that, I mean, considering that private entities usually only invest in profit or interest expected initiatives, do you think that this would somehow be able to work out? What strategies? need to be in place to draw the private sector investment into these climate initiatives is so that even if there might not necessarily be a direct profit on the table, they still are able to put in their funds into this uh, climate finance initiative. So how do we think we can work out this uh, um, fund from these private uh, entities that we need to be on ground? I mean, for having me again, eh? uh, the, the, the original convention, and then when we came to the Kyoto uh, Protocol, was that uh, we have the common but differentiated uh, responsibilities, and that the developed countries that developed using uh, fossil fuels and uh, coal and all that uh, were the major cause of the global warming and the, the, the gases that went up and those are the ones that are bringing the, the great impacts that are coming to us. And so there has always been a fight where the developed countries uh, were, have been saying, no, 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 we are not responsible. So we, 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 we want to have a, 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 an agreement. And this is how we came to the Paris Agreement. We had to have a, 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 a compromise where we are saying the national circumstances, of course, whatever, but... In it, Paris 2015, we pushed a lot in the negotiations and we got Article 9 of the Paris Agreement. And even in Article 9 of the Paris Agreement on Finances, it is still talked about developed country parties. They shall provide financial resources to the developing countries. And so actually the responsibility is not to an individual uh, company, an individual person, it is to a party to a party. And, and therefore, even if we are going to invite the private sector uh, within our national countries, we will need to be thinking in terms of are they the ones polluting? I mean, they are making our country to be called a polluter. So if the, the companies and the private people are the ones polluting, they own the factories, they own the, the, the oil farms, then there could be some methods. And I think Germany is one of the countries that is pushing. If the polluter is paying, then each individual country now will force its companies, its peoples, to give some money towards uh, mitigating or an, an adaptation to climate change. Because 
Uh, this can be done through LFS in these countries, the uh, introduction of LFS, of course. Uh, but then again, if the, 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 the companies have made a lot of profit, like the ones that are now here in Africa, in West Africa, in Central Africa, they are making a lot of profit uh, out of their, 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 their work, uh, that is now not green, it's a, a definitely brown. Then we need to ask ourselves, how do we motivate them to give part of their profit towards mitigation and adaptation in Africa? Then the issues of uh, tax debate and uh, things like that have to be thought about. Incentives that are going to say, okay, you give so much uh, and your, your tax farm, your tax body is very happy with you in your country. They may reduce your, 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 your taxation and things like also registration has to be put in place uh, that is going to encourage a, a lot of this interaction, both at the national level, because it's only a nation which can control its own factories and its own people. And then uh, outwardly there, now the country under their NDC, they can be able now to report, this is what we are able to do, this is what we are able to achieve. And now, uh, instead of introducing uh, the interest uh, taxes on uh, flying and things like that, that are going to even to curtail the trade that uh, the developing countries are trying to catch up uh, with the rest of the world. So I, I feel it's, uh, uh, we should not lose the sight of Article 9 uh, of, of the Paris Agreement, uh, as even as we encourage the private sector uh, to be motivated by the individual countries uh, to move from the, the, the destructive, the polluting uh, systems to the renewable systems. And that again brings a problem. Because if a country is moving to, uh, to, green pro, to their green uh, technologies, it means they are not releasing more money to the global south. And now that's another issue that uh, uh, we have to think about as we develop the, the procedures, uh, the regulations, and that is why now we need to capture all the avenues of resources. That's what I meant. We have to capture all the revenues of resources that come to the south. If, they are going to, if the resources are going to come through Article 6, then we push through Article 6, we get resources. If they are going to come through uh, MDBs, the multilateral development banks, then we try to push through there. If it is going to come through bilaterals, we push through there. If it is going to come through uh, uh, the reduced uh, concessional loans that are going to be uh, very, very low interest and they are going to take a long time to pay, and even the debt uh, swap that we are talking about, then we need to encourage all these traditional methods of raising resources. Thank you. And, um, David, I also want to hear your thoughts on that as well. How do you think we can bring these um, private sectors on board? Or do you think there's another, like Mr. Gibson is pointing out, if there's another way we can look at this to ensure that we get these resources? So do you think that private um, entities will be able to work with us on closing these financial gaps that we're looking to? How, how do we bring them on board in this conference? Or what other um, strategies do you think they need to put in place to put in people that would be able to put their money, like you said, where their mouth is. So what, what do you think we can do as regards this situation? I think it's a clear demonstration that uh, by the very virtue of the presence of very many private sector investors already at the fault and even in a business market home, including in the development of the NDC, their contribution uh, also indicate that there is some good deal from the private sector. But however, it's a localized policy issue, and as Drago indicated, that it depends on how the government handles its own businesses at back at home. There is no way we are going to have taxes imposed on businesses and then expect that they will also not try to maximize profit, sometimes by going in the wrong direction. I think for me, uh, while the police phase principle, common but differentiated responsibility, is important, I do think that back home localizing policy that enables businesses to thrive, such that within the environment in which they thrive, they feel a responsibility to be able to take care of, of, of their own emissions. And we incentivize green entrepreneurship in the sense that there are tax rebates, there are waivers sometimes that are afforded, for example, to emerging technologies that are helping us to tackle the climate crisis. Say, for example, if a company is engaged, uh, let's say, in a, in, a, in a polluting industry sector, and they decide to make it, then there has got to be that just transition that is also midwife by the policies that government helps to make. But I do think that, for example, in most countries, we, especially in Africa, we've got very organized chambers of commerce, we've got very organized private sector alliances, 
that are always coming up with innovative solutions to try and tackle the climate crisis. While not all of them perhaps are as honest as we would hope, it is clear that there is some good will somewhere. But this marrying of the two doesn't happen because largely, for example, the systems that they are supposed to feed into are flawed. Everybody wants to see what money they put, what the, what the money they put into a system does. With issues like corruption, lack of accountability, and transparency within our governance system, it becomes very difficult even for private sector to engage. There is also one aspect we cannot overlook. When a multinational, for example, does not pollute in its own home country, but has been allowed to consistently come and cause problems in terms of, the, of contributing to the climate crisis instead of reverting the same in our country, then that is an issue that requires to be addressed. We cannot have an issue where there are children of a lesser god, some of them are being seen as if they are not supposed or they are not entitled to climate as a common good, but the others are entitled to climate. If we are going to make wins with the private sector, it's got to start back home. It's got to start with policies that actually make sense. And guess what? In my short experience within the climate and environment space, it is evident that people try to ape that which looks like it's a dalit. There's a reason why a good policy has got ripple effects in terms of being adapted, adopted and adapted to various contexts across the country. Say, for example, a good policy comes from Kenya. It is very easy for the East African community to try and emulate, embody the same to revert the climate crisis. And we cannot ignore the presence of companies and countries that are locally established and locally driven. Most of these, um, for example, innovative companies and private sector uh, organizations come together and they have got very innovative solutions that will help us to, for example, uh, do carbon thinking and even enhance our capacity to address issues that are caused by the climate impact. But what we are received with is the same equal measure of low policy, a business environment that is exactly the same as that of the polluter. There have got to be, there has got to be a way through which government will work with policy through which government actually alludes to private sector directly with a clear mechanism of where do the money that they give into the climate cost end up? What do they do exactly? Because when you cannot create that simple linear connection between source and end user, then businesses will not make sense out of this. One of the other aspects we cannot ignore is the financial institutions that we have in our own country and also uh, the likes, for example, the African Development Fund. It's a trendsetter. In fact, I, I could say here that I was a bit surprised, for example, that the loss and damage fund, uh, the FIS that was identified was, uh, was, was, uh, was World Bank. I had hoped that because loss and damage really affects a lot of the global south, I would have been more comfortable, for example, if even African Development Bank or the Asian Investment uh, in, uh, Infrastructure Bank. But now we have World Bank, it already holds some of, of, of the climate financing which uh, has been a burden to our own country in, in the sense that it is not run. It, it, it's added debt and we continue to struggle and we do have the right to develop. And the right to develop will also be midwife by the financial institutions that we have back home. Businesses have also got to be enhanced in the banking sector and financial sector to only offer support to businesses that are climate progressive. If policies could be created in such a way that, for example, climate progressive loans have got lower interest than, than, than the other secular or ordinary, ordinary loans, then perhaps that would also encourage private sector to gravitate towards, to, towards investment in climate for the purposes of averting the climate crisis. The question lies with also, as I said, accountability, governance, and transparency. It is not going to work unless we have clear, believable, and working systems that are very good on paper, but also very good practically on the ground. Um, one of the most contentious issues is still the transition in a way from fossil fuels, with each of these countries at a divide and economic realities at play. Will COP29 be able to deliver a strong and a unified stance on transitioning away from fossil fuels? Stay with us. We'll dive into this hot topic right after the break. Don't go anywhere.
you're still watching the COP29 series on Green Growth TV. Now, with um, President Aliyev advocating a more balanced approach due to economic considerations and mounting uh, global pressure to accelerate the shift to renewables. Now, the question is, what's, what's the progress? I want to come to you, Olumide. Um, what's the progress at the conference towards achieving a strong and actionable agreement on this fossil fuel transition with the whole back and forth. There's been a lot of back and forth on it because of the um, economic benefits that come with it. So they seem to have not been able to get to a conclusion yet. So with the issue, so what's the issue of fossil fuel transition like right now at the conference with the whole back and forth on this particular matter? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will just quickly uh, round up by saying that, uh, you know, when we talk about transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy, it has been a conversation that uh, 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 will get worse. And looking at the conference itself, happening in a land that is actually, uh, you know, a living on this issue of fossil fuel, how do you want to drive a conversation that is going to change the narrative of developing countries? So it is a very big challenge. And I'm very sure that uh, it's something that we need to start looking at uh, uh, how do we look at the issue of adaptation? How do we look at the issue of mitigation? And how do you look at the conversation we are talking about, the issue of loss and damage? Because when you look at transitioning, transitioning without a commitment that a pledge that is going to make the people that are the receiving end understand that they are the ones that need the solution. Transition that is just the paperwork. How do we make that transition locally driven? transition that is not strengthening the economy of developing countries. I think we need to start looking at how do we also look at our local adaptation strategy as a developing country to start building on the, uh, the leverage of what we can do as a country from Africa. Because every time we ask for climate finance, well, we are asking for this funding not only to, you know, to solve the economy, but only for some people's... Uh, 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 selfish interests. Let us look at it from this end. When you talk about transitioning, what is the economy saying about economy uh, the economy of Africa? The economy that is not progressing and you are looking at transiting. We need a lot of local mechanisms, we need a lot of uh, local actions to be able to look at transitioning into this so-called renewable energy. A good example from Nigeria, when they said gas is our transition model, some weeks, some uh, weeks back, we see the uh, the solution of the CNG. He busted in Lagos, also in mm -hmm. part of Benin. Are we are we looking at the local actions before we are fighting for the transition? So we need to start looking at our transition model to drive our local action because local action is what is going to push the conversation in the global stage for people to understand that this money we are clamoring for, this climate finance we are clamoring for. What are the mechanisms? What are the, uh, 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 the channel, the Green Climate Fund, uh, the Small Grant Program? All these funds are available, but how are they channeled to local action so that we cannot be thinking about our local transition way and it will be able to solve the local problem that we see? So for me, I think in this ongoing conference, there has been a lot of selfish interests when it comes to developing countries, even though mm. there has been a a uh, positive uh, uh, commitment, positive pledge of funding, but how will this cascade into the local action? Like I said when I started, I said when two elements are fighting, it's the grass that suffer. We will continue to suffer if we don't get the finance into the place. They say, you put your money where your mouth is. When you are putting your money in the right position, then you get the right data to influence more actions on ground. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olumide, for joining us. Um, Olumide has to get to another um, event right now, so we we'll let him go. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. We appreciate it. So now, David, let me come Thank to you. you. I'm looking at everything that Olumide has pointed out. Of course, as much as we're pushing for the um, transition to renewables, how do you think we, we still know that uh, these fossil fuels do drive economic growth? So let's look at it in terms of striking a balance. So how do you think we can strike the balance between pushing for green transition and acknowledging, still acknowledging the role of fossil fuels for especially 
especially these oil producing oil producing nations so how can we strike a balance between uh, realistically transitioning to fossil fuels and still ensuring that the economy does not suffer so how how do you think we can do that at this conference or has there been any significant improvement on that topic at this conference First of all, in um, in my view for the longest time, and this is the position I hold, is that Africa should not be banned one to join the conversation or in, uh, divest from fossil fuels. We should be talking about investment in renewables because we don't even have adequate energy despite even having countries that are, for example, um, already you know selling oil and petroleum products. I think our conversation largely in Africa has to be talking about how do we invest more in renewables? Because even the investment in, uh, in fossil fuels are largely not our investment to be very honest. So yeah, investments that are driven by external forces, including the market for the petroleum and oil products, it's, it's not all within our control in most cases. Why is it that, for example, countries that are producing uh, the fossil fuel energy and exporting it in large quantities? are not the most progressive. For example, we have in Africa yet, we see countries in the global north that were built on those fossil fuels and, and you know, the, the non-green energy. Supply. I think the conversation in Africa should be to how do we invest more into green and renewable energy without, of course, imagining that it is safely and clean and idyllic and there is nothing wrong with it on the environment. All we are saying is that it is, it is better than, than having fossil Right. But we need to be conscious, of course, and that's why just transition becomes a very, very important conversation. And if you'd like to break it down, just energy transition becomes an important conversation, but it is not just a conversation, it's a way forward. How do we design, for example, our grid back at home so that they are ready to receive renewable energy? We cannot be having, for example, um, countries that are imposing, for example, that station on solar energy because they want to maintain control over their people by creating dependency on the and we have had instances of such where, for example, installing a solar panel in South Africa is more expensive than actually installing uh, power from ESCOM, from the grid. Such kind of redesigns that enable even the lowest person to have the power to own their own energy and even feed into a grid are very, very important and inevitable. The people that are working in those uh, fossil fuel industries are also our own people. We need to find a way through which we will do technology and transfer. So that if somebody has been working in the oil rig, then they can get an opportunity to be able to move into the renewable energy sector with adequate skills. That is not going to happen overnight, let's be honest. You're not going to change all our vehicles into electric overnight. So, yeah, so even in any case, we don't have charging stations in our own villages. In fact, some of our villages don't have power that would allow, for example, electric vehicles and even motorcycles to be to be, to be charged at any given. But I'd like to give an example. For example, in Kenya, we have seen uh, a clear investment and an interest in the production of uh, low-cost motorbikes uh, that are electric because of the booming industry that uh, was created within uh, about maybe the last 10 years. The development of motorcycle transport has increased significantly. Now, seeing electric bikes in my village is a motivation to a young person to know that they can be able to invest in renewable. And they don't even have to understand the fossil fuels renewable energy struggle. But we do need a fossil fuel space out. It has been demonstrated by the IPCC several times since COP24 when it was very heated that if we do not alter the usage and extraction of fossil fuels, then we are heading to a very serious climate crisis and it might even feed more than two, the two degrees that we are targeting to below 1.5. This also calls for goodwill and no double speed. You cannot be speaking about renewable energy and how glossy and beautiful it is and continually investing into the fossil fuels industry. Our financial institutions are critical indeed. I have not seen yet companies that are able to invest significantly in fossil fuels energy without getting loans, for example. We've got to rewire the way our financial institutions conduct their own lending and even enhance capacity for people who are um, investing in renewable energy to be able to take that step. Our industries are going to suffer definitely, but what I do know is that I believe in the African people's resilience. In Kenya, when we were talking about the burning of plastic bags, it was largely decried that we are stealing jobs, about 6 million of them, but guess what? 
the woven buzz now that have led to a better and cleaner thing have have created more jobs than the plastic bags industry used to create. And this is what innovativeness of our African people look like. We cannot be able to talk about what we feel uh, face out or without even also engaging those that are involved in the industry itself. But the power lies in the people at the bottom. If we build the capacity of our people to understand the significant impact of fossil fuels and driving extraction, additional extraction, then we will still continue to have them depending on the state. Most of the people that consume these uh, petroleum products, these fossil fuels, are on the lower cadre of our economic structures and, and, and economic level. If they do understand the value, for example, of a solar lamp vis a vis a kerosene lamp and the damages that it causes both on health at the year level, they don't need to understand the impact on climate change as deeply as perhaps expert negotiators and policy makers would be able to understand. They just need to know why it is bad at the social, health, and home household level. Then the demand will be created. And I speak from experience, I have seen this in my own country in Kenya, where we have had women, market women, make a significant shift from kerosene lamps for the night sale into solar lamps that they charge during the day, and including solar radius that they listen to after charging throughout the day and it goes throughout the night. This has driven significantly a demand for solar powered gadgets at the lower level. This is definitely going to cost a shift in the end. Last is that I would like to speak about civic education because civic education is what will help us to drive good policy by electing people who are also climate conscious, people who have uh, renewable energy at heart and from a personal perspective. As a passionate leader in that regard, policy will not be personal legislature in our legislative houses without involving the, the, the ideology of the people to shift from fossil fuels and get into renewable energy. I don't know if you have any thoughts on what David said, but um, aside that, the chief executive uh, vice premier, Ding Shuishang, I hope I pronounced that correctly, emphasized the stronger need for early warning systems, uh, you know, as regards this um, climate crisis. So what, what do you think we need to see at this conference in the, improvement, in the improvement of early warning systems that would ensure that the resilience and the adaptation is built properly? So let me just hear your thoughts on that oh thank you um the early warning systems uh, of course um, uh, are based on uh, the, the, the elements of uh, of climate the elements of weather and again also the factors that um the where the, the those elements are working on them so like um we are talking about temperature, we are talking about uh, precipitation or rain, uh, we are talking about wind. Um, and of course, uh, because of all those things that are, are change, the air pressure that changes, uh, the range of sunshine, the humidity, all those elements now come and impact on our ocean, um, uh, the, the waves, the deals with the cloudiness and visibilities. And all those things now we, we are talking about, do we have some early warning system where we'll be saying, okay, this thing is about to come, or it has been announced uh, a through onset, it has been building up, building up, and within the next two, three days, it's going to be worse. So, uh, of course, this has come up from the, the General Secretary uh, of the United Nations, uh, remember, it's also the co-presidency saying uh, that no community is left uh, without uh, these life-saving uh, methods and measures by the year 2027. So when you think of the year 2027, we, we're talking about two years to come. Mm -hmm. And we, we are thinking of all the communities. We are thinking of all the countries. And uh, for me... Uh, I was trying to find out in the agendas that we have at uh, COP29, and um, uh, I still feel it's uh, quite far. Uh, it's it's a, a pipe dream because uh, we are talking about utilizing artificial intelligence, 
We are talking about using remote sensing. How many experts even now in our countries are able to utilize the, 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 the remote sensing um, programs, the, 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 the satellites that are there, even the, the meteorological departments or uh, offices in many countries, we have maybe two, three who are, which are working very well. Uh, but uh, trying to think about all communities, and uh, those are count countries, and then you go to a country, you go to subnational uh, governments, like in Kenya, we talk about counties, and going all the way to areas which are going to be affected by floods, affected by droughts, affected by the humidity, the change in humidity or sea level rise, uh, things like that. Um, it's really not uh, uh, not possible within those two years, uh, but we can try. Uh, it's just like the land degradation uh, neutrality was supposed to be achieved by the year 2020, and we've not achieved it, uh, but we are still continuing. So I have seen some progress uh, in our country. Let me see the Kenya Meteorological Department had, had forecasted that uh, um, by the beginning, by 4th of November, rains are going to come, and actually they have come around that same time, same time. I've uh, seen the issues of the tsunami have been uh, uh, early warning systems, at least in Mombasa, and it's recorded in uh, Hawaii. And sometimes these things, uh, I mentioned some certain things which are global, uh, are, are, it's, it's possible to, uh, to get enough money from big companies and uh, big governments and the United Nations and, and put money into the early warning system. But what about small, small uh, cases? Because especially now we are talking about the local communities. I have just a few cases of early warning for river flows. Like I have a place called the Wasonyiro North, uh, where uh, the the whole river course, uh, certain communities have agreed when they see the water level rising uh, in the river, they can take a photo, and um, there, there are some three four marks which shows it is green, it's yellow, it's going to red. They can take mm -hmm. photos and send to a central place and be able to uh, be able to communicate to the community to move away uh, or stop doing something. But to say that uh, uh, we may not be able to achieve that, but if the push is picked by many, uh, many development partners and many governments, uh, rather than just being left to the two leaders, the co-presidency and the secretary general of the UN, then it can pick up and in a small way, uh, even as uh, social uh, corporate responsibilities, the local banks, uh, the local institutions, the local companies uh, can actually assist some communities to have some simple uh, mobile phone use uh, uh, way of... Uh, because even those old days, people used to have um, megaphones and they would mm -hmm. announce when there is an emergency. Yeah. Uh, those, they would throw some horns and say there is some... Uh, uh, some we have seen some enemy coming uh, or a riot somewhere, and I think it's the same traditional method that we are trying to bring now uh, using the newest uh, method. So uh, remember, some events are sudden and they are extreme, and they are now too extreme that uh, those local local systems uh, may not give the, the fair effect, the very uh, powerful effect that is going to happen. Others are so uh, so slow in coming. Uh, that the government should have noted and alerted people. But how often does this happen? And I think most of the money that is kept for these uh, maintainers or for these emergencies, sometimes it becomes very quickly used for political expediencies uh, and to solve a, a certain problem. And uh, so uh, there, there has to be a concerted effort to do this. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as well, well, it's obvious that this COP29, or it seems as though the COP29 is prioritizing vulnerable communities, like you, you've made mention of uh, these vulnerable communities that need uh, help. So now, um, just c following up with what you've said, are these most of these communities that we have suppressed? They're usually in the decision. They're usually suppressed rather in decision-making processes. So, so far in this COP29, is there much progress on this um, marginalized? 
marginalized voices, for instance, some African countries, have we been able to make meaningful impact on the policies that have been developed so far? What's, what's the progress on that uh, in COP29 as regards um, these marginalized voices that are usually suppressed when it comes to decision-making progress, I mean decision-making process rather? Is there much progress in that um, regard? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, th there is this perception that uh, the IPROC, the, the, the indigenous people and the local communities uh, wear some traditional clothes, some uh, feathers, and um, some whatever. And uh, so, so sometimes they, they also do some cultural dances and so uh this has been made uh, caricatured into some form of uh, sometimes even when we, we 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 go there for public participation uh they they, they will sing a song they would they dance they would give some traditional food and uh, sometimes uh, as i think david had mentioned something about uh, the capacity building, the, the knowledge before even that day that we come for uh, participation, for them to give input to the new COP decision or to the new registration in the country or to the new Climate Change Act or to the new NDC that is being made or to the new project that is coming on climate change. Uh, most of the time they are lost in the, in the preparation of uh, uh, of the very fact that they are the same people with low literacy levels, uh, the, the same people who don't look at the news and read the papers, they don't even know COP29 is taking place today, except one or two that were airlifted and they are there, and sometimes they were supported by the, 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 the fossil fuel companies uh, that we're actually talking about, and they are kept in rooms and uh, in places, and sometimes. Uh, I, I had an opportunity recently uh, of training uh, a number of them who are going to COP16, uh, uh, UN, uh, uh, UNCCD, uh, COP16 in Riyadh in, in December. And even the issue of how do they address the media or how do they, do they, do they move around in the center and know about the, the, the program and how do they even talk with the, some agency that has said, or are you the UK prime minister who says, is going to give money for NDC partnership to help the communities to participate in the NDC development. How do they access that money? Do they even uh, know the reason why it is announced and how to get it? Do they know the, the, the officer that is tasked, uh, tasked in that country to follow up on that commitment that made at COP29? So I have a feeling, as we have said, that uh, definitely a number of them are, 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 are suppressed because sometimes mm. that is where the multilateral uh, companies, uh, the multinational companies are putting up oil factories and uh, their petroleum products, the factories uh, are digging the oils. Then sometimes the, the, the stakes are too high for the government, which is looking for the dollars, even to listen to the, to the two, three voices that are trying to push. But let me be on the positive side. I would say that uh, presently we are preparing the national uh, determined contribution, which are, are supposed to be paid into the UNFCCC by February 25th. And in my assumption is that uh, the national governments and the subnational government are already collecting some information from the vulnerable communities to be able to push this uh, in, into their documents. Of course, we are also having the NAPS, the National Adaptation Plans, that uh, many countries, especially these development countries, many of them are saying they are still not developed. But as they are developing them, uh, this is one of the preamble articles in the Paris Agreement that these are, are the communities whose voices should end up uh, being felt in the decision that is being made. So that when the draft has gone down there and it has been discussed, their contributions can be shown uh, through some tracking that that decision, their, their, their fears, their worries, uh, and the agreements with the, with, the, with, the, with the people that are coming on board to help them has been factored in the new, in the new uh, legislation or in the new policy. In Kenya, we are developing the, the carbon markets. That's another area, uh, another gray area where forests and uh, big chunks of land are going to be used for carbon markets. 
And the question now is uh, the communities that are, are living there, uh, what percentage are they going to get from the, the, the monies that are going to come out of Article 6? And, and the, the place uh, of the negotiation, uh, it just says, of course, they will negotiate with the with the with the relevant ministries, especially of environment and forestry, they will negotiate and sign some agreement on the the, the, the proceedings and the, the proceeds that they are going to get and how they are going to get it. But have we seen it happening? Uh, it is a, it's a sad story that uh, uh, we had some oil companies that were developing some pro, uh, some oils. And uh, when they were transporting their their products, we saw the communities uh, blocking them along the road because they were saying our our our, our cake our cart mm -hmm. has not been left in our in our in our local area as we transport this crude oil uh, out of the land. So you see now again the issue of capacity building, educating them that this oil has to be refined, it has to be sold, and when it has to be sold, there is a certain amount that will come to the country. Then from the country, they are going to give you your 25% or your 10% or whatever agreement they had done it. But you see now, uh, that now means that the person who is going to talk to them is going to miss uh, his political uh, acumen, his, his base. So what happens is that you find no politician is willing to come and defend the registration uh, that they have made. No, no technical officer is ready to come and defend the policy and the decision that they have made at, uh, at COP29 or 28. So, so I have this feeling that uh, if Paris Agreement was passed like uh, close to 10 years, uh, 10 years ago, because when we were in, in, in Paris in 2015, and next year is 20, uh, 2025. And up to now, uh, we, we are still talking about the, the, the demonstrations in, in Ibaku of, of people saying our, our, our voices have not been heard, our voices have not been heard, and they are challenging the, the national uh, country position papers. They are challenging the uh, AGN position, or they are challenging uh, the, 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 the Brazilian or the, the, the South American position about the Amazon. If these people, after 10 years, and this was even after the convention, which was 1992. You still find that uh, there is no framework, a correct framework, where they can be taken to court and told you were people A, B, C, D signed as you had agreed, and they gave you a few have been already been put here, and we can show you in your local language that this has been captured. So I, 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 I close my case by saying that... Uh, the world, the world Leaders Forum, sometimes when they come, of course, they, 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 we, we anticipate that the leaders talk on behalf of their communities, including the local communities and indigenous peoples. We also assume that the media um, uh, really helps. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the only problem sometimes government complains is that the media is more biased towards the civil society opinions. Uh, and uh, both the, 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 the government side uh, and the local community side is left hanging. Uh, so, so it should be uh, 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 an active, uh, maybe proactive thing that even through this media, you need to, to we need to find out uh, some of these uh, policies that are being made in Nigeria, in Kenya, in wherever. Then we pick uh, a document that has been approved now by parliament after public participation, follow the community from there and find out from this 25-page uh, registration, uh, what were your concerns when the public, uh, when the people came, the consultant came, the MP, the members of parliament came, uh, the technical people came, the donor also came and visited the area, and you gave your your views. Can you see any trace of your uh, one of the item, item, one of the agendas, or an annex, or an addendum, or something? in this document that shows uh, your views have been taken on board. Until we start doing that and uh, a few people um, uh, are held to account for, for not factoring in what the community's opinion have said, we will still have this uh, for another uh, 10, 15 years. So.
Thank yeah, you. All right. Thank you, Gibson. So um, finally, and let me just come to you, David, as we wrap up the program um, with warnings that we're in a final countdown to keep the temperature rise within the 1.5 degrees Celsius. What more do you think needs to be done at COP29 to steer nations back on track to meet this critical goal? So just um, that and just give us your final thoughts on the program as we wrap up the conversation. Uh, I do think, first of all, that we have a very bad culture at the top that needs to be ended mm. as soon as we are able to. We need to ground ourselves in the COP that we are in and stop talking about COP30 while we are still doing COP29 because it clearly demonstrates we do not have goodwill to solve the problem today. We would like still to have another COP to do the same. If I remember correctly, I was taught that insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. We have been doing COPs for 30 plus years now, and we are getting worse and worse results. So I would like to think that that is even worse than the least. At COP29, we need to, first of all, prioritize the NPQG. We need to make sure that even as much as we see consensus between the interests of the developing and the developed world, that there is a just search for and pursuit of and, and honest, genuine pursuit for that an NPCG that is favorable, not just for the developing world or the developed world, but that cuts close to ETC. But we need also an admission of error, grave error from the, from the developed world that has developed by destroying the climate for everybody else. Until we get to a point where the conscience of those governments actually allows them to admit fault to what they have done, then it is not going to get us any. COP29 must come up with a clear mechanism for how the financing that has been promised before is going to be delivered. We cannot wait for COP30 in Brazil. We cannot wait for the intersectionals in Bonn. It has got to happen now. But there are also other things that should not be thrown out of the table. For example, we cannot be discussing issues about finance and a future that has no food. Food systems and agriculture need to be given priority and addressed in a manner that demonstrates sustainability of the thing. That is not happening at the moment, and there is a clear shelving off of those important agendas that we should be having. I think COP29 has got an opportunity also to rally forces together so that commitments that have been made before uh, can be honored. There is no need for us to get more commitments before we honor those that we have had before. It is really redundant in my view. I also think that there is an important aspect of the means of implementation, especially of the mitigation. And, uh, and, and, and I think the mitigation agenda has taken um, a shadow, uh, the shadow of adaptation, which uh, I think has made a bit of, of progression. But uh, there is still the issues of how do we, for example, um, get to metrics that are actually uh, verifiable with the, uh, with the global goal on that stage. Those are things that the corporate nine must be able to deliver on. There is also the trend to move slowly, like we are witnessing now. There is, there is a bit of um, luxury in the first week of the COP. And then we see everybody now trying to run to get consensus and to build, you know, some outcome at the end of the COP. This needs to change. My final thought, this is an excellent conversation that I think should also now consider progressively an inclusion of the gender angle so that the perspectives that are aired here are also representative as well of another divide and different aspects of the top conversation. That young people who are involved in this conversation to demonstrate also intergenerational, uh, intergenerational solidarity and support for intergenerational dialogue with colleagues who are as experienced, for example, as, as Gibson in the state, and we ourselves who have been joining in the state and are continuing doing the state. Green Growth Africa has done a wonderful, wonderful thing to convene this conversation, and I certainly hope that this continues to inspire more people to come and discuss matters, climate, and other matters related to green growth, especially in Africa, and I am Pan-African. I am selfishly Pan-African without apology. 
Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much for that. Um, from groundbreaking financial mechanisms to operationalizing key agreements, we can see that the progress made shouldn't just end as talks, but should translate into real action. The talks that are on climate change should also change something. And this bold commitment can be achieved through accountability, inclusivity, and of course, sustained efforts. Thank you so much for joining us on Green Group TV. As we follow these developments closely, do stay tuned for more updates and we'll continue to unpack the outcomes of the COP29 and the implications for our shared future. I'm Tony Ogobanjo. It's bye for now. Thank you.